The Highland Charge was the shock tactic that earned the Scottish clans of the 17th and 18th centuries a reputation as fearless and fierce fighters. However, it is best known for its somewhat disastrous use at the Battle of Culloden in 1764, which was depicted quite well recently in the TV series Outlander. It must be emphasized, however, that such popular depictions distort the reality of this tactic a little bit. The Highland Charge was not as unsuccessful as many movies or the Battle of Culloden itself might suggest. Actually, it proved to be a real challenge to the British government troops and scored the Highlanders several victories on the battlefield. In this video, we ask what made this tactic so effective and how exactly it worked. In a swampy area southeast of Edinburgh, an army of the British government confronted an army of Jacobite Scotsmen on the 21st of September 1745. They decisively defeated the British forces using one of the most successful Highland charges ever. The Jacobites were supporters of the House of Stuart, which had been the ruling family in England but was replaced when James II of England went into exile after the Glorious Revolution. The Stuarts lived in exile in France, trying to regain what they believed to be their throne. With this in mind, Charles Edward Stuart, better known as Bonnie Prince Charlie, traveled to Scotland in 1745 to start a rebellion. Numerous supporters, mainly men from the Scottish Highlands, joined his ranks and helped him capture Edinburgh, Scotland's capital, on the 17th of September 1745. Sir John Cope, the commander of the government forces in Scotland, reacted quickly and marched to retake the city and stop Charles with an army of 2,300 men and six cannons. When the Jacobites came to meet him, he positioned his troops behind a swamp south of the village of Preston Pans, ready for battle on the next morning. However, the Highlanders did not wait until sunrise, but marched around the marshy area and approached Cope's troops from their eastern flank. Just in time, the commander noticed them and realigned his troops to face the attack. But his soldiers were not prepared for this and offered little opposition to the highland charge of the Jacobites. First the artillery fled, then the cavalry routed, and finally the infantry gave in. Suffering less than 5% casualties, the Jacobites defeated the government troops, killed about 500 and captured at least as many. What made this quick victory possible was the psychological effect of the highland charge. Being on the receiving end of such an attack was terrifying. One of the few survivors of the Battle of Knock and Noss in November of 1647 recalls that the Highlanders, quote, came routing down like a torrent tempestuously on our foot, end quote. Similarly, the government troops at Preston Pans faced a mass of seemingly mad Highlanders who ran towards the muzzles of their muskets, regardless of the consequences, frantically shouting Gaelic war cries. These examples show that the power of the Highland charge lay less in the actual force of impact but in the fear it inspired in the enemy. Even experienced soldiers panicked at the sight of charging Highlanders, let alone new recruits. That's how you beat the red coats, eh? With a Highland charge! At Preston Pans and also at Killy Cranky in 1689, another battle often discussed in this context, gaps opened in the enemy lines even before the Highlanders had actually made contact. The psychological effect was, in fact, so important that there are very few instances of a Highland charge actually clashing with an intact enemy formation. Should the enemy stand firm, the Highlanders usually stopped just before the clash, retreated and charged again later. If they didn't stop though, a fierce melee would ensue, in which the Highlanders would easily get the short end of the deal, as was, for example, the case at the Battle of Culloden, about which we will talk in a minute. First, let's take a quick look back. The origins of the Highland Charge are very much shrouded in myth. Although many historians reckon that the Highland clans and their Irish allies first used this tactic in the 1640s. Some scholars, for example the military historian David Stevenson, attribute its invention to an Irish officer named Elster McCullough who allegedly developed this tactic for the specific needs of his troops during the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. While this is not conclusive, it is certain that the Highlanders had generally relied on charges for a long time, with the Highland Charge as such being an adaption of this tradition. Before the advent of firearms, Highlanders relied on tight formations led by heavily armed melee fighters with axes and claymores, their infamous two-handed swords. This tactic was no longer practicable in the 16th and 17th centuries, 
when arquebuses and muskets, and consequently pike-and-shot warfare, spread on the British Isles. Therefore, the Highlanders adapted their methods, exchanging their heavy axes and two-handed swords for lighter weapons, such as basket-hilted broadswords, long knives, axes and round shields, most famously the distinctive targes. In addition, they increasingly relied on firearms. These weapons perfectly fit the needs of the new shock tactic they now began to adopt, the Highland Charge. Like most shock tactics, good morale was the key element to a successful Highland Charge. The men had to trust each other and their commanders, and they had to be absolutely determined to charge at the enemy, fully aware that they would at least face one volley. Because of this, friends and family members usually fought together and formed groups of about 12 men. Also, speed was of the essence, which is why the Highlanders usually got rid of unnecessary clothing before the battle and preferred dry, slightly descending terrain. When they were ready to attack, the Highlanders advanced towards the enemy, fired a volley from about 40 to 50 meters, and then started charging. Covered by the gun smoke, shouting and clamoring, they ran forward. And as they ran, they formed up in clusters, most commonly in one or more wedge formations, aiming at the weakest points in the enemy line. And if this terrifying wave of warriors, quote, was not enough to persuade the other side that they had urgent appointments elsewhere, end quote, as the historian Charles Carton puts it, the Highlanders threw themselves onto the enemy lines to break the formation. Just before making contact, they dropped to one knee, drove under the enemy's weapons, parried the pike or bayonet of the men they were directly facing with their shield and then thrust upward at the unprotected upper body of their opponent. If they succeeded in breaking the line, they proceeded to take the enemy down in close combat, relying on the advantage of their shorter weapons. The Highlanders skillfully exploited the weak spots they created by fear or force, by pushing into the formation, rolling up the unprotected flanks of neighboring units, or going all the way to the back of the formation to stop those fleeing and cause even more chaos. These charges by no means always went as smoothly as at Preston Pants. In the aforementioned Battle of Killiecrankie in 1689, for example, an outnumbered Jacobite army defeated Scottish government troops by intercepting them on the pass of Killiecrankie and using the Highland Charge to break through their line, which was stretched out to maximize firepower. The government troops fired three deadly volleys before the Highlanders reached them, and in the ensuing melee, the Jacobites suffered even more casualties, eventually losing about a third of their army. One reason for the high losses the Highlanders suffered at Kilikranki was that their opponents were equipped with a new weapon that enabled them to defend themselves much better against shock attacks, the Pluck Bayonet. The Bayonet functioned as a sort of half-pike that allowed the musketeers to protect themselves when charged. Because of this, the pikemen who had previously performed this task could be replaced with more shot units. This significantly increased the infantry's firepower. However, the Pluck Bayonet had a major disadvantage. It was inserted into the musket barrel and therefore prevented shooting when mounted. Consequently, a formation under attack could only fix the bayonets in the last minute. Because this took considerable time, the attacking troops had a good chance of reaching them before they were ready to defend themselves. The introduction of the Pluck Bayonet was a part of a rapid modernization of the British army in the second half of the 17th century. Quickly, the bayonet became standard infantry equipment, and the cumbersome earlier muskets were replaced with lighter flintlock muskets, and prefabricated paper cartridges were introduced, which made reloading much easier. Towards the end of the century, the pluck bayonet was replaced by the socket bayonet, which was attached to the side of the barrel rather than plucked into the muzzle, making it possible to shoot while it was mounted. These changes proved a challenge to the Highlanders. To avoid the volleys from the more efficient flintlock muskets, they often laid down on the ground after firing their volley and let the enemy return fire. This way they were less exposed and the powder smoke got even denser, providing additional protection. Nevertheless, the new British army made for a tough enemy and the Highlanders' casualties increased. This development reached a climax in one of the most famous battles in which the Highland Charge was used, the Battle of Culloden, on the 16th of April, 1746. This battle showed what could happen if a Highland Charge clashed with a formation that stood firm. After his victory at Preston Pants, Charles Edward Stuart had advanced into England. However, before he had achieved anything of substance, his army began to crumble because of internal differences until he finally had to retreat. 
when he learned that the commander-in-chief of the government forces, William August, Duke of Cumberland, was approaching with an army of 9,000 men, he arrayed his remaining 5,000 men at Culloden Moor to await the pursuing army. During the night before the battle, the Jacobites again tried a nightly assault, but failed because they didn't find Cumberland's camp in time. So, for better or worse, they had to stay in their rather unfavorable position. The next day, the 16th of April 1746, Cumberland's artillery opened the battle. This caused heavy losses and the Bonnie Prince had no choice but to order a direct attack. Not wanting to provide the artillery with a target any longer than necessary, the Highlanders ran across the 500 or so yards of boggy ground between the two armies and charged Cumberland's men in three groups. When they closed in, the British switched to canister shot, shotgun rounds for artillery, which caused heavy losses even before they reached the British line and slowed down the center. To avoid the boggy terrain in front of them, the group in the middle veered to the right. Meanwhile, the groups on the left and right made contact with the British infantry, who had specifically been instructed to endure the charge and not to leave their position. On the entire front line, Cumberland's men thrust at the enemy to their right instead of the one straight ahead to avoid the Highlanders' charges. This was quite effective and the Highlanders on the left eventually had to retreat when Cumberland's cavalry counterattacked. The group on the right wing, however, managed to break through the first line after a bloody struggle but was pushed back by a regiment advancing from the second line before it could exploit its victory. This was problematic because the Jacobite center had joined them to exploit the weak spot there and now both were caught in the crossfire of the government forces. In less than half an hour, nearly 50% of men who had participated in the Highland Charge had fallen and Cumberland's cavalry massacred hundreds more as they tried to flee the battlefield. Despite this devastating defeat, the Highland Charge remained in use for several decades after Culloden. However, as firearms improved further, it involved ever more risk. This became clear in what was allegedly the last Highland Charge, which took place during the Battle of Moores Creek Bridge in 1776 in the American Revolutionary War. In this battle, about 1,000 Highlanders in the service of the English Crown charged an equal force who had entrenched themselves on a bridge. They were mercilessly shot to pieces. Thanks to all our patrons for the continuous support. We appreciate the support tremendously, especially in these times when the financial future of our channel is not really that secure. So if you want to help out, have a look at our Patreon page.